So uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, it's an important meeting in that we're going to be wrapping up the first uh, set of activities for the PMAP. We've invited um, all members of the President's Management Council um, for all the CEOs in the room who remember those the deputy secretaries at the major agencies, everybody who's in town is here, so these folks not only have um, they were in town attendance. These folks not only have uh, significant internal responsibilities, as we've talked about before, they are the equivalent of the COOs of their of their agencies, departments that run very large organizations, organizations that rival all of yours in terms of size and complexity. Um, and uh, at the same time, they have external, uh, uh, equivalent customer facing responsibility. So it's a, it's a tough job, and all of them have done a very good job of improving their operations. And they're already feeding into their operational plans the IP ideas that have surfaced here and the SES um, improvements. So we're going to um, spend till about 11 reviewing uh, the progress of the pilots and discussing how we're going to roll out um, both IT and SES improvements across government. We'll take a quick break at 11, and then we're going to focus on what's next, what terrains we're going to focus on for the next uh, nine months or so. Uh, I think, given that it's a Friday and given that this group is known for its productivity and efficiency, <laughs> and early side, so we'll, we'll shoot to be done by 12-ish um, or so. Uh, we will have a, a box lunch that we can uh, incorporate into the last session. And um, with that said, why don't we sprint around the room and just do uh, quick introductions? Because I think while many of you have met, it's been a few months. So. Steve Rockman, Executive Director of the President's Management Advisory Board. Estelle Richmond, Acting Deputy Secretary for Housing, but our new deputy has been confirmed up last night, so I'll be returning to my Chief Operating Officer. Mm -hmm. Jim Cole, Deputy Attorney General. Dave Capos, United States Patent and Trademark Office. Rebecca Blank, Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Seth Harris, Deputy Secretary of Labor. Tony Miller, Deputy Secretary of Education. Uh, John Barry, Office of Personnel Management. Carolyn Coleman, Deputy Commissioner of Social Security Administration. Bill Core, Deputy Secretary of HHS. Dan Poneman, Deputy Secretary of Energy. Kathleen Merrigan, DEPSEC Agriculture. Sam Yellowland with Sabre. Gail McGovern with the American Red Cross. Enrique Salem with Symantec. Tim Salso, formerly with Cummins Engine. <laughs> <laughs> he said with a huge smile. I know. Why do you guys always smile so much? <laughs> I just retired, that's why they're here. How many years as CEO? 40, oh, 12 years as CEO and wow. 40 years with a company. Oh, Amazing. Wow. 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 When you joined, what was the size of the company in terms of revenue or employees or some metric? Probably. Uh, 300 million in sales and maybe 5,000 employees, and it finished last year 18 billion and 60,000 employees in 190 countries. So a lot of changes in. So what's that 60x on revenue? <laughs> That's not bad. That's job <laughs> creation. <laughs> well, uh, Greg Brown, Motorola. Good morning. I'm Ron Williams. I'm a retired chairman and CEO of Edna and currently with RW2 Enterprises. Jeff Kindler, formerly with Pfizer. Shantanu Narayan, Adobe. Um, Debbie Lee with BET Networks. Liz Smith, OSI Restaurants. <laughs> I want to thank everybody. So I'm, I'm on page um, three of the deck. I'm deaf two. I'm deaf two. Um, and I think this is largely repetitive, but I said we want to review progress on the uh, 2011 recommendations. We're going to go through the pilots. Importantly, um, these pilots, I think, across the board have been successful. Uh, not to say that we uh, don't have more to be done, but we want to make sure that as we continue to drive forward the pilots, that we roll out the learning across government so we can maximize the impact. And then, as, uh, then we'll do a smaller session, um, uh, hopefully by about 11, that focuses on what are our next set of topics. Um, I'm going to hand it to Stephen to start with SES training. Okay, so we're on slide five. Um, I want to get us to a conversation pretty quickly here, so let me just do a fast recap of PMAP's recommendations around uh, new development opportunities for the senior executive service. So the group's main finding was that 
it's really an absence of a cross-agency approach to building leadership skills for uh, new SES members. So, you know, we have these federal executives, they're expected to come in and demonstrate a, a standard set of competencies across the government, yet there's really no mechanism for them to formally develop those skills, uh, at least not for the majority of the SES, and, and not really in a cost-effective way. So the PMAP members, uh, the subcommittee of them, worked on this issue, and they recommended a series of skills-based training modules which would be targeted at SES members in their first two years of the service. And they offered to partner with federal agencies to stand up uh, these modules and try to leverage those shared resources between the private and the public sector. So on page six, we'll see how things turned out. The last time that we were all together back in November, we were just getting this exact kind of way, and I remember thinking, boy, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but here we are almost five months later, and we have developed and delivered two modules twice each. Uh, we've trained about 350 federal executives from 40 different agencies. So we've accomplished that goal of reaching across the, the government. And this was truly a team effort. We had an interagency working group uh, dedicated to this. We had lots of help from uh, OPM, John's organization, from DOD, Social Security Administration, and many, many others. Um, and of course, we had ongoing involvement from a number of the PNAB organizations, uh, Motorola, Cummins, Red Cross, uh, BT Networks, Sabre, uh, all of your HR executives were just tremendous uh, in doing this. I think you all know what kind of effort it takes to do this. As for the sessions themselves, one of the modules focused on how to lead your organization through a transition, and the other one dealt with how do you use talent development to elevate the performance of your organization. So both of these were topics that the new SES had said were a priority for them to, to learn about. And we designed each session as a blend of some classroom type teaching of tools and frameworks. We had some breakout exercises. And then without a doubt, the most valuable aspect of it, if you look back on all the evaluations we got, um, were the panel discussions of senior federal officials and the keynote speeches from our PNAB executives. We actually have a number of folks in the room today who played those roles. So Tony uh, Miller and Dave Kapos came in and uh, participated in a panel to provide their perspectives. And then the keynote speeches we had delivered by uh, Jeff Kindler, by Gail, by Sam, and Greg, in your case, uh, Shelly Carlin, your HR executive, came in and delivered that. And first of all, it was incredibly generous of all of you to, to do the preparation and come into the town and do that. Um, but more importantly, you just did a terrific job of inspiring all of these new leaders in government. So what I'd love to do now is actually just go around to, to each of you and get a little bit of your thoughts on these sessions. You know, I know you weren't there for the entire uh, session in each case, but I'd love, love to hear kind of how this compared to other leader development sessions, what you might have taken away from these um, I don't know, should we start maybe with, with Jeff? Uh, sure, Steve, thanks. I'll put you on the spot. No, no, uh, I, I'll just say I, I thought it was a fantastic experience. I was really, really impressed by the uh, seriousness and the dedication of the group. You know, we, those of us that are on this committee, uh, and, and we're actually advocates for this being an important part of our agenda as a, as a, uh, as a council or as a, a board, uh, have always believed that the SES is really, in many ways, the key to advancing many of the goals that we have for, for, the, for the government. And this really just reinforced to me what we all believed and knew, which is that this is just a critical cohort of people. They're very, very dedicated, very, as we all know, uh, very serious about uh, what they're trying to achieve. I think they had an opportunity themselves to network across agencies in a way that they might not normally have that chance to do as a result of this. We all know, having been in these sorts of programs or led them, that oftentimes the most valuable things actually go around, go on outside the actual formal events. And I think that, you know, from the minimal time I was there, but I could see that was going on there. And I thought that I was very impressed by um, how uh, serious and thoughtful they were. In, in my case, we were talking about transformational change and transitions in organizations, how it might differ in the private or the public sector and how it actually doesn't differ as much as people might think. And I thought they, they took it very seriously. They had very good ideas about it. I was just very impressed. And it just uh, struck me, Steve, as just reinforcing uh, the premise by which we went about this, which is it's, there's a real need for this and a real desire for it. And I think uh, 
uh, what we really ought to do, as I know you are doing, is thinking about making this a more sustainable, permanent uh, uh, part of the, the culture and uh, the development of, of the SES group. So I thought it was a, a terrific uh, experience. Putting aside, you know, whether whether what I contributed was any good or not, I think for the people that were there, it was it was really very valuable. Others. <clears throat> Well, first of all, I would say um, the people. So we've we've gotten some exposure to the SES within these meetings, and so you think, okay, this is the this is the best and brightest of the SES coming in to see us. I felt like the quality of the people in the room, really high quality folks, very engaged. Um, I sat in on some of the sessions. I looked through the whole curriculum, and it, re it was really well done. First of all. Um, sat in on some of the sessions. They were doing breakout sessions at s certain points within the within the training, um, which I hate. I hate breakout sessions personally and don't like participating in them. But they they uh, they did a. They were very engaged um, and seemed very committed to to uh, improvement. We were focused on coaching and and development. So a lot of what we talked about was linking the mission of the organization at a high level to what people are working on day in day out. And, uh, and it was really, I think, and, and to echo Jeff's comments, um, there really seemed to be very few differences, particularly from a coaching and development perspective, but I think you found as well as you engaged with these folks um, on, on managing change, very few differences between private and public. Um, so we just, I found it to be a very, uh, very engaged audience, um, and I thought the curriculum in particular, the whole thing was very well done. So congratulations on that. Yeah, the, the only thing that I, I could possibly add to that is, um, first of all, it was very personally gratifying to see all the conversations that we had in here suddenly come to life and be real out there. And it seemed like you set some kind of land speed record to get this um, organized and brought to life. And um, so that was great. Also, on a personal basis, it helped me to organize my thoughts a little bit. I mean, you know, you're leading through a transformation, and sometimes you don't have time to look to the right and left of you. So it was good for me to just be introspective and try to figure out, okay, so how the heck did we actually do this? And what advice could I dispense? Um, I, I would just echo my colleagues' thoughts about how bright and engaged and just how smart people were in the room, how earnest they were. I mean, I, I bet collectively there were 500 pages of notes because everyone was scribbling. Um, and they, they take their, their work very seriously. Um, most of my life has been in the for-profit space, but now that I'm in the non-profit space, I can draw all kinds of analogies about people that are mission-driven, that are there to serve, that care passionately about um, what they're doing, the impact on others, and it really would shine through. So my hope is that we sparked a couple of nuggets in there and that they were able to see some things that resonated and um, were able to take it back because it, uh, it was a great experience for me. And I think just teaching leadership is a big, uh, <coughs> big ambitious thing to do. And I, I feel like the team really pulled it off. So kudos to the folks that organized it. I just want to thank each of you because, you know, it's one thing to come to these and say, yeah, you'll participate, but it's another thing to actually show up, do it, put the forethought into it. And one of the things I heard in talking to a lot of the SES attendees is what what they were most impressed with was the willingness of, you know, major CEOs to, to take the time to engage with the government and to share lessons learned that are easily transferable in terms of leadership in large organizations and change management. And you know, I just can't thank you enough for putting the personal energy behind it. it that, that's what I think made the difference between this training exercise and other trainings that we've done is the engagement of the PMAB and, and the participation, your personal participation, you know, guaranteed attention and, and a depth of, uh, uh, of energy at those sessions that we wouldn't have gotten any other way. Just a couple comments. I, I would pick up on five words Gail said. They take the job seriously, and that, I think, was, was to me evident in the part of the session I was in that when CEOs of major companies come in and communicate by their actions and their presence that 
we, that you are taking the, the career SES of our government seriously, they take themselves seriously. And it played out in a second observation I had. I got some emails afterwards after our session, which included some fun banter that the, the takeaway these folks had was bias to action. When they hear from CEOs from companies where you have to act every day, that's what you do. Right, they got the message from you, yes. right, and from the whole session that SES and leadership is about bias to action. I think you hear what you want to hear. <laughs> this man has a real bias to action. <laughs> I think it's wrapped up. The urgency is, uh, is an important message. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because I mean, part of it on our, on our panel. Um, we, we, while there were themes, we all had slightly different approaches to some of our approaches to transformation. And I thought it was helpful for them and some of the back and forth to see this was just very authentic and real. And so there is not like a cookie cutter approach. And I think one of the things in our Q&A, which what I thought was interesting is, you know, I th part of that is not just seeing different styles, but it was in fact them going through, okay, we've got to figure out the right answer in our context. And so it was also that shared leadership model that I thought we were trying to model a bit. So that, because I think that's a big part of it. It is not like, this is just about pure execution of an agenda, but it's about helping to literally shape that agenda when there's uncertainty, um, when in fact there are different choices. And if you couple that with, okay, do we sit back and wait or we do something, I think um, that was the tone of the discussion I thought was very, very constructive. So, so I think that we're clearly onto a winner here. Um, you know, we underinvest overall in training and development. Uh, it's the first budget that gets cut. And we need to do more of it, particularly for the SES. Jeff, you're right. It's where you know a lot of our future lies is in making sure that we attract and retain the very best managers and help develop them. So I think the hard part here is um, asking more time from all of you and from and broadening the circle. People don't have to be on the PMAB CEOs, other CEOs, whether they're in the Washington area or across the country can get involved here, but I don't think this is a hard call as to whether this works or not and whether it has a high return. Jeff? Can I just offer one observation about that? And something Gail said made me think about this. You know, this is not a one-way learning experience either. Uh, I certainly found that in preparing for it and thinking about it, and I talked a lot about I probably talked more at Steve's encouragement about mistakes and things that didn't go right than I did otherwise. But to the point you just made, if more people uh, of, of influence in our society had exposure to this cohort of people, their view of the government and of people that work in government would be very, very different. Um, Agreed. Th these are not the people that meet the stereotypes that people have about government bureaucrats and the rest of it. And especially as we got into conversations, and, and I gather you did, Sam, as well, that there is really much more similarity than difference in the way that you uh, coach and develop people in the private versus the public sector. Uh, so just picking up on your point, another maybe possible uh, thought coming out of this is, is if we can ex increase the exposure of business people in general to the SES, it's a, it's a two-way street here in terms of what they will gain from it because their perceptions of who is in the government and how government works and what government people are like. Because CEOs tend to see political appointees, yes. mm -hmm. and which is great, and there's many in this room, so I'm not you know, <laughs> saying anything negative about that. But the SES are the people that are there year in and year out, yes. carrying the administration of, or carrying the government forward. They're the real heart of it, and they don't, uh, aren't uh, consistent with the stereotypes people have, and I think if more people got to see that, they'd have a different view of things. So we should think about, I, I don't have an action item on this, but mm -hmm. just, you know, I think we gained as much, at least I did, from being with them as maybe they did from us. Yeah, I would just like to add to that. I think that what Jeff said was a good point, but to your point, Jeff, um, that um, bringing more CEOs and perhaps COOs mm -hmm. in to talk about management, to talk about leadership development, 
uh, on an ongoing basis would be a great thing because um, one thing, well, I started off as general counsel of my company and then became COO and then became CEO. So I hadn't thought a lot about management before I became COO, so I had a lot of on-the-job training to do and learning. Uh, but one thing I've learned after having done it for this many years is that people that do it like to talk about it. Yes. And as Tony said, there's no one way to do it. People, when I run into CEOs and COOs and we start talking about management and people, and you know, there are a lot of different ways to do it, but people that do it love sharing their learnings because most of us didn't go to school for this. <laughs> we learned it on the job. Uh, you know, some people go to business school, but a lot of people don't and work their way up through a company and then all of a sudden uh, they're in a management position and they have to figure it out. You know, how do you motivate people? How do you reward people? Um, you know, how this, should the organizational structure uh, be set in a way that works? And, you know, I really uh, do believe that um, if you tap into, you know, the right CEOs, they'd be glad to come in and share their experience. And it would be helpful, and as, as Jeff just said, it would be a two-way street. I think you're right, too, to broaden it to COOs. Yeah, no, of course. You know, you know. And other members of the senior team. Right, because it's very, you know, the COOs a lot of time are doing the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. Then when you become CEO, you realize you got to add vision onto that, mm -hmm. and you have sort of a different, different uh, perspective. So it is um, a fascinating area that I think the SES people would enjoy talking about and, and you would get a good quality of business leaders to come in and share um, their views. So Stephen, why don't you do very top line slide seven, which is the, just the feedback, and then let's spend time on eight, which is taking us to the next level. Okay, good. So the participants validated what we're all talking about here, which is that this was a really valuable experience for them. 85% uh, of them rated overall the training as very good or excellent. You see some of the, the quotes we got. I could have printed pages and pages of, of outstanding quotes. Um, we also wanted to know how to improve these with an eye toward uh, you know, making this a more permanent thing. Um, we got a, a, some patterns we saw in the feedback were make the session a little bit longer. As we talked about, they don't often get a chance to network with their peers in other agencies, so I'd like another hour or two to do that. Um, the breakout exercises, I think we could make those a little bit more rigorous based on the feedback we got. Um, bring in maybe some career SES on the panels to balance out the uh, political officials. Again, no offense, but uh, the folks in the audience are primarily career SES, and they want to hear from that perspective, too. Um, and then the idea of, you know, this was primarily targeted at executives in the Washington region. About two-thirds of them are here, but of course there is a willing audience outside of Washington, so what's the best way to, to expand this out there? And we also wanted to know what are some other topics if we try to expand the, the curriculum to, and so these were things that we heard a lot. Navigating relationships with political appointees, how do I develop business acumen and apply it in my role? Um, and then, of course, very topically, uh, I want it's important to keep driving my organization toward its mission, but how do I do that with scarce resources? So a lot of food for thought as we move forward. So then on page eight is looking forward. It's clear there's demand for this. What's next? So we have been talking to an organization that is within OPM, within John's agency, known as the Federal Executive Institute, FEI. Um, they have a long track record of providing leadership training to government executives. Um, their offerings tend to be more of the sort of intensive courses that last a week, two weeks, even four weeks at off-site locations. And so as FEI is looking at this pilot, they're seeing it as a nice way to complement what they already have, kind of to provide a diff different type of training that is more accessible for greater numbers of executives and it's cost effective, which is important as agencies tighten their budgets. So as we've been kind of beginning to talk through this with FEI, the idea would be that we could use the two existing modules as the foundation for an annual series. So if I'm a new member of the SES, I start out, I come to an orientation. And there is actually already an orientation that FEI runs. It's more to give these executives a sense of the environment that they're coming into, the political environment. It's not as much skills-based, but that's the start. And then over the subsequent six to 10 months, there would be up to five individual modules, each one on a different skill. And so you would attend each of those. And you would probably see a lot of the same people as you go to each one of these. Um, the next orientation is actually scheduled pretty soon. It's in May. And so the idea would be to get this series up and running, building off of that May session, so, so very soon. 
Um, we've got obviously a, a market that kind of keeps renewing itself. The numbers show that about 500 new uh, people enter the SES every year just in the DC region and another several hundred across the country. So um, certainly a, a market for this. And then as we kind of started to talk so that's about 10 percent of, of the SES each year is new. So in five years, we think that roughly half of the SES will be new. Is that about right, John? Yeah. And then we, as Jeff was saying, we certainly want to find a way to continue to work closely with PMAB and potentially draw in some other private sector companies too. And so FEI, a couple ideas here. FEI would love to set up an advisory board that would include uh, potentially HR executives from, from PMAB uh, and other representatives to advise this effort. Um, as Jeff also talked about, we'd love to find a way to have you continue to serve as keynote speakers or potentially uh, COOs, even if it's just once a year, it's, it's such, so uniquely valuable to them. Um, and then uh, space as well, I think most of that falls on federal agencies offering up training space, but potentially PMAP companies too. So a few ideas. I don't know, John, if you wanted to chime in here. I think bearing in on Deborah's idea, if, you know, especially this, the last points, we're not going to be able to meet the demand with this, the scale that we've got right now. And, you know, nor can well, your schedule's a lot like uh, you were very tired you, down. <laughs> I'm wrong. You, know, you, were, you were very generous with us this year. Maybe 150 days a year times three quarters. <laughs> There, there's a nice. We have a nice golf course we could arrange too. But the, uh, but um, but uh, you know, I think growing a cadre and, and and you know, to the extent you all could help us, you know, develop a cohort class that of both CEOs, COOs, that you know, asking your colleagues and 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 members, uh, you know, you, you could help us build this group so that we'd have a real deep uh, bench to draw on would be, I think, phenomenal because I, I I really. I think the most powerful link that we've been able to build here is the public-private connectivity, and and I think that adds a depth to this that we've never been able to have before. So, you know, I, I think Deborah's idea would be one to, you know, you could really help us grow that group. That would I be one. I think the thumbs up we're looking for from the board is we're going to go ahead and create the demand. <laughs> Will you help us scramble and fill in the supply? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we will. It's going to be the published calendar yeah, um, good point. with the dates, and it, it would not surprise me if a bunch of us can sign up for dates and then just find colleagues that could, could fill in the blanks. Because most CEOs, sure. yeah, you know, so, so many CEOs that, come through We all do it for, for each other. Yeah, I mean, I know I've right. been to probably five or six, you know, different you know, fortune companies, and then I ask them to come to right. mine. And exactly. so there's already a network, to Deborah's point, because you kind of, we, we yeah. just put, give you guys a CD, and we just keep rotating, because I think that there's a lot of willingness among all um, leaders, not just in the PMAB, to do this, because I think everyone said, you benefit, and then they benefit, and... And what may actually think he's down the road on, on Liz's idea is if there's that network out there where you need speakers, having maybe some of the SES come and give a government perspective, government management, for, you know, could be a real, right. it builds on that, what you talked about, of just helping to people understand how their government works Absolutely. and to see the quality of the people that are involved in it. Right. Really um, yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, before her, Becky has a, a comment to make, before um, she does, Becky um, has done everything at the Commerce Department. She was confirmed as an undersecretary. She acted as the deputy. She acted as the secretary for a significant <laughs> period of time. And she just got confirmed last night as the formal deputy. Um, so long. I yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I've been acting for a year and a half, and as my husband keeps saying, don't you have your actor's equity card yet? You know, so, uh, but I'm tearing it up as of this morning. Um, so I just wanted to make the comment that as at least the people on this side of the table know, um, Scott Gould, our colleague at Veterans um, Affairs, has been putting together an SES training program, not for entry-level SES, but for across the SES that I think many of us have bought into and are going to be um, paying the freight on. It would be very nice if these could be integrated and thought of as a single set of programs as opposed to Two completely separate programs. Town, but we were gonna, yeah. If he was here, yeah. we were going to show how that integrates. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. Good. The, the only other thing is, talk about the scalability. I do think we should leverage technology 
And so taking video, right, the interviews, the video snippets, yep. because I think it's the opportunity to take this whole curriculum, Good. put it in little snippets, and then it'll go viral as well, right? If it's really valuable, and I yes. think it is, it'll be, hey, this is, and so I think we can get a lot more bang for the buck, address some of the regional issues if we think about it then. All right, let's, uh, I'm going to keep us moving. Uh, that was, okay. Thank you for all that you've done to date, and thank you in advance for helping to fill the demand. John. Well, building on that, uh, we were very fortunate that a number of you had gone through this exercise in terms of how do you appraise performance over the, and had done it in a recent time frame. And so we were able to greatly benefit from the experience that a lot of your companies had gone through. And the first gap when, when we sat down with, with uh, your folks and looked at this was Though we hired consistently across the senior executive service, we had these, uh, we had what we called uh, our, our ECQs, our, our uh, uh, the, uh, they were leading people, leading change, results driven, business acumen, and building coalitions were the five that we, we hired people on. But then we sort of dropped the ball in that we did not consistently appraise towards those five standards. And what we ended up with was about 40 plus appraisal systems of the senior executives across the government in varying forms. And uh, some uh, totally missing uh, pieces of those five ECQs. Uh, some having, you know, the, the, the focal point on leadership, for example, was very different across the government in terms of agencies. Um, what the, uh, that was the challenge we found. Um, the solution was obviously to see if we could come up with a framework to provide some greater consistency uh, across the government. And so uh, the, the beauty of it was uh, uh, building on some of the tools that you all had, we were able to do that, uh, and working with the colleagues here on the PMC. Um, the ultimate goal is to both lift the performance standard, and originally when the Senior Executive Service was created, it was to be perceived as a senior management cadre that would give you flexibility in response that if you needed to move people that you would have a mobility element. One of the things that had prevented us from doing that was these different performance evaluations um, it, you know, really was a, a barrier in the way of that mobility program. So I think this is going to really help us accomplish the original vision of having sort of that talent managed uh, consistently and seen as a base that we can deploy, uh, you know, across. So the the good news is is uh, we've we've built that uh, that approach based on your input. Uh, we have some early adopters of this program, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, where it's seven agencies that are going with this consistent approach. Um, and they're large agencies, so it's going to give us actually the seven probably reflects over about 60 to 70 percent of the workforce uh, of the senior executive. So I think it's, it, it's going to be, uh, th that's going to give us a real sort of good turnover. The goal is obviously to bring everybody on, uh, you know, and I think we'll be actually in a place to do that well before the completion of 13. So we'll be able to start that through 12 and get into it in 13. Um, we are uh, uh, looking on developing that, uh, the technical guidance that we can share on this with all of our colleagues, getting the tools, the training materials, all, all of the stuff that we need to do to get better buy-in uh, is out there. But uh, one of the things we wanted to get your feedback on today was you know, sort of looking ahead here. Um, it, you know, how do we ensure that we maintain the rigor in this? Uh, John, you're on slide uh, what, 12? Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we'll go right into the, uh, the key questions. Um, and, you know, there's a tendency, I think, and, and, and we heard this from, from your folks as well, that, that, you know, when these are fresh, they have impact, but that they quickly stale and uh, in terms of the appraisal mechanism and, and how you maintain the freshness of those conversations so that they are real and not become a rote checkoff, uh, you know, situation where, uh, you know, you, you go from having the hour conversation to a five minute pass in the hall, you know, checking the box. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, we're already, you know, that's one of the things we're getting feedback from some of our agencies who are piloting this, is how do you maintain that, that focus on vigor? And really wanted to get your impact on that. And, and some of you, I see Gail already nodded, that that's something you've already encountered too. So, you know, 
I'll be quiet and, and, and we can we can throw it open for the group to discuss some of these challenges of, of how we keep this going. Yeah, I think there are a couple of uh, suggestions I would have. One is uh, to do it twice a year so that it's not an annual process only, but that it's part of the normal management process and that there really is a scorecard and documentation that literally every person in the organization at the appropriate level has two in-depth discussions a year about their performance. Uh, Ron, are those the same form and the same rigor yep, both same times? same form, same rigor, uh, twice a year. Um, I, I think that's the first item. The other is to uh, have a discussion among the peer group so that, let's say, your direct reports who are scoring their people, that there is sharing, and to the extent people have inter-rater reliability, because one of the things you find is one person let's just say that the K rate is different for each person. <laughs> and so one of the opportunities is to synchronize the definition and the rigor across the management group. And so some discussions uh, about how people are performing so that it's not just in the silo, but it's a horizontal discussion and people can, can have that conversation more robustly. Those would be two suggestions. I, I would add, um, uh, it, I don't know a system that can force people to do good ones. It, it really is the individual themselves that see this as an important part of their responsibility as a manager. And so um, what I always try to do is establish a principle uh, among managers that every employee has the right to know how they're doing and where they stand in the organization on a regular basis in an honest way. And so if people, more people can see that as their responsibility and obligation to those employees, then it's a good thing. And then the, the second thing, I don't know whether you do employee surveys or not, but mm -hmm. uh, in the employee surveys, I would incorporate, you know, did you have a, a per performance appraisal? Was it a, how did you evaluate it? Did you learn from it? I, you can ask those kinds of questions. And then you'll see patterns, if you look at that, where some organizations or some managers are doing it very well. And then you'll see other places where they're not doing it well. So you know where the issue is, and then you can go in and address it. Sure. This is very common between the, the decay rate or whatever, is that I think tone at the top is really important. And um, it takes a lot of time, thought, and effort to do a valuable appraisal, but you owe that to the folks that work with you and work for you. And so where I usually see it break down in our organization is if the leader has somehow convinced himself that he's too busy and his people are too senior and so they can kind of do a flyby. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that the tone at the top is is that you all have very, you model the behavior, you model the feedback, and then the people that are with you know that this is the quality and time that my manager took to put into it. I really don't have any excuse to do a flyby, and it really holds together that way. But once you convince yourself up here that you're really busy and these people are senior enough, that's where it starts to fall apart. And are most of you on this twice a year cycle, or are most doing it annually? Or once a year. We do it once a year annually, Jeff, but one suggestion I had was sometimes decoupling it from the salary process right. yes. I think is actually a really good idea okay. because then it doesn't become a justification and it really becomes a career development uh, discussion. And so uh, I think we do it more than once a year informally. We do it once a year formally at this point. Uh, but I think... So you do it... One in, one for one. Yeah. And the informals the around yeah. the yeah. here the, the discussion is really around the bonus. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the informals around the bonus and the formal is decoupled. We're trying to decouple both actually, I see. Uh, and we're trying to decouple both because otherwise people don't really uh, hear the career discussion and all they're looking at is yes. what the numbers mm -hmm. are. Yeah. And so I think and the second one we to model the behavior that Liz talked about. 360, you know, I mean, it sounds, again, uh, pretty straightforward, but when people know that you're going to ask people who work for you feedback, your boss's feedback, and your peers' feedback, it actually sends a, a, another tone in the company, which I think is important. Yeah. I, would, I would add two um, other ideas that we use uh, very successfully is 
We have performance plans for executives that have issues. Now we also have a lot of coaches, which is probably not something um, that you want to spend the money on. Um, but um, you know, once you you don't just we don't just do a review and put it in a drawer. You know, if there are issues, um, it's good to to tell the executives what they need to do to improve and then to check back in with them and that could be you know the informal review but really to say okay these are things you need to work on we're going to talk about it in six months we're going to talk about it again in a year so you really know there's some accountability and the second thing is that uh, the CEO of our parent company has meetings with individual division heads so we come in and talk about our leaders and ex assess them in front of him um, and you know, I, you would have to tell me what the counterpart is. I don't know if it's the secretary or assistant secretary, but if you know, you have to talk about your people and you yeah. know, give an assessment on their leadership ability, their performance, their future at the company. That makes you focus on it uh, a lot more, also. And we do that annually, where we just go in and talk about our you know our stars, people that aren't. Um, in that top leadership group, and that really holds us accountable. Some of the agencies in the pilot are trying quarterly. Is is that too much? That's a lot. <laughs> I yeah. see a lot of heads. Yeah. Okay. Jenny, I, actually, I, actually, I heard the comments. I think it's once a year formally, and I, I like the idea of decoupling. It is absolutely right. But I think you got to give people at least once a quarter a check-in that says, "Here's how you're doing," and, and everybody's got a. We, we have a structured what we call a victory plan, which are every manager in the company has specifically what are their objectives for the whole year and we check in on, on those quarterly and get very specific feedback on those and that starts with my staff and it goes through to every manager in the company. Can I just yeah. ask a point of clarification? I think feedback, quarterly feedback is important and I'm going to go with Shantan who said but if you, if you put the full administrative burden of cranking that out quarterly it's going to fall apart is, is, is my experience. So I think the there's kind of one formal year right. end, but that quarterly feedback and making the time to have those quarterly discussions. In my organization, we don't do it. We do it twice a year. We have a mid-year discussion, which is on the books, and then we have a full year end appraisal. But I think if you literally rev the engine up four times a year, oh, no way. That, that, that'll that become more of an administrative burden versus a healthy dialogue on feedback. Yeah, I, I would agree completely with this. I mean, we do four times a year, one, one formal a year that's just Full the system, and every quarter we check, check in. in. All right, so just the, are you monitoring those check ins? So those check ins, like the good managers do it and the weaker managers yeah, don't? Or, do so that is something yeah. that's being tracked. Yeah, I, I think, think the system software support of this is important. In, in some of the comments, uh, at least some of the others. One of the things that I'm not clear on is every department has its goals, exactly. but does every individual have an individual scorecard separate and distinct from the department's goals that outline what they're supposed to accomplish? And then that becomes part of just the normal ongoing management process. And then in terms of whether you choose to do it annually or quarterly or whatever, there has to be a system that, that creates a level of visibility. We had 50,000 employees and we knew that 98.9% had had a conversation by July 1st, and that was published, that was visible, there was no place to hide, we knew it by unit, and then through the survey you can get the sense of the quality of those dynamics. On the performance uh, feedback part, I think one of the things that's important also is to crystallize the feedback into the one or two critical issues that represent the developmental needs of the person. Sometimes the laundry list is so long, the person feels overwhelmed. If you can really distill it down into just the one or two things, this person has to demonstrate leadership in implementing, transforming this particular project initiative, uh, et cetera. So those would just be a few additional comments. Just, just to add a couple of things. So um, what I would caution is um, the performance management process is being standardized um, for transferability and comparability of ratings. At this point, and it's so new, everybody has their own style here, once a year, twice a year, quarterly. So I think the risk of being overly prescriptive around the process is not a substitute for management. Right. So we have kind of two principles. Number one, there's no such thing as a surprise review. So if I sit down with John Barry and give you feedback or a review and you're surprised, I haven't done my job. So if you as a manager 
embrace the idea that there cannot be no such thing as a surprise review, then it's up to you to determine how. And while we may want to be formulaic, once a year, twice a year, check a box, if they accept that responsibility that there's no such thing as a surprise review, it allows a little bit of a more natural engagement. And second is I distinguish between the performance review and feedback. Performance review can be whatever. Feedback's immediate. So if there's an engagement and it goes well or not well, I as the manager say, James, do you have 10 minutes? First of all, here's the three things you did really well. Two things you may want to think about differently. If you sit down quarterly or in July and say, James, you remember the February meeting on the, no, I don't remember. <laughs> Feedback's got to be immediate and no such thing as a surprise review. And that will drive the natural flow of review, what's comfortable for the individual leader of the department. Mm -hmm. Let me echo a little bit of uh, what Greg just said. Um, first of all, I think the reason that performance reviews are not robust is because it's hard to have a difficult conversation. And so th what happens is the manager sugarcoats it, and they walk out thinking, well, I, I told them. But people hear what they want to hear. And so there is a big miscommunication at the end of it. So one of the things that I have done over the years is I coach my team. I want you to give every single employee at least two or three areas for development. Even if they're perfect, you can find something. And I've primed them so that when they come in, they're going to hear you know, two or three areas for development. And therefore, they don't take it personally. They know that these are coming. They may not even be things that they're going to be able to improve. I mean, you know, you get to a certain point in your life where you're hardwired. But it teaches you how to have a difficult conversation. And once you become more comfortable at that, it's a lot easier to just give regular feedback. The other comment I'll make about giving regular feedback, I don't know if you're all familiar with this Gallup survey. It's 12 questions that can measure employee satisfaction. And remarkably, it takes 10 minutes to fill out. And somehow or another, the folks at Gallup have figured out these 12 questions that are absolute measures of employee sat. And in the for-profit world, they also become leading indicators for customer sat and profitability. So these 12 simple questions, you nail it, it's done. One of the 12 questions is, has your supervisor given you feedback in the last seven days? Seven days. So if, if you're answering no to that, you're not a happy employee. That's how regular these conversations have to be. And you know, Liz's point, you don't have to gen the people up and you know, have a flood of paper. But if you haven't heard from your boss in seven days something about their performance, that means you're not a happy employee. And once you have that in your head, the dialogue becomes much more continuous, I think. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add one thing, and, and Ron touched on it with the system side. The, the other thing is, the reason reviews actually can be hard to what Liz was saying and people not getting them done effectively is because it is an event. Yeah. See, and, it, and, that, and that's, that's absolutely the wrong way to go. It's, it's a matter of what we've been trying to help our managers understand is how as you go through the year are you tracking the information and, and we've built systems that allow us to collect that information as you go. And so one of the things that we can actually get a lot of visibility into is, is there no comments about employees throughout the year? And then when the review process comes in, it's not an event. Great. This is at least a challenge in our agency, and I think coming to some of my peers. There's 6,000 SES, right, over, I just said, like 1.9 million. There is an expectation, there's a culture that says, I'm already in the elite. Shouldn't 75% of us be outstanding because we already have arrived? And so that becomes, so you have, a, so let's separate this out. There's a notion of calibration of performance and how do we get calibrated on what's expected at the senior most levels? And then how do you have more personalized feedback based on we all have development needs? I actually think we're focused on both issues. And the real context is if 75% of our folks, right, ish, two thirds to 75, think they're outstanding, that provides a real challenge for what are we differentiating within? And so I'm curious in terms of, I'm, I'm, I'm curious in terms of the analogy, in terms of are, how much variation, how do you calibrate amongst your senior most executives? And I know I'm going to be an outlier here, but I actually agree with that. If, if there are 6,000 people that have managed to rise to that level, 
you know, hopefully you're not going to find people that are unsatisfactory performers. But that doesn't mean they're perfect. They might be outstanding, but there's still areas for development. So personally, I, I've always, you know, uh, cringed at a forced curve. Um, I, you know, I, I'd be hard pressed with my own leadership team right now to say who's the bottom of the pack. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that you can't give robust feedback. You know, everyone has an area of weakness. Um, so I, I personally, I have no problem with rating somebody outstanding and saying, but you really need to work on this one area. So. I mean to frame it as a choice. I'm, saying, I'm assuming everybody's yeah. going to get that. I'm just saying I'm, the core question of performance differentiation. I'm curious about. I, I guess I would. I have a different perspective, which is that every time you're at a level, right, the bar is reset for expectations. So I'm sure we all experience this. The first time you get the reviews in, everyone at the top. Your whole budget on exceeds is taken yeah, up by the people yeah. at the top and the people at the bottom. And the reality is there's a difference between giving people credit for experience and the level they should be at. So I actually do think the curbs, there's no, I, I, I agree on the force curb is out, but I think they need to look very similar at very level because the water level rises and the expectations rise and you don't get a pass because you made it to VP. That's right. It's an expectation of a performance level at a VP, and now vis-a-vis -vis relative to your peers, y you you have to always be evaluating across. And so I I push back, and I I would bet every single one of us encounter this. Absolutely. The more senior executives are, the more you have to help them understand that every year they didn't hit the ball out of the park. And you have to do that by holding them accountable for having a more natural curve. So I actually, I'm actually not yeah, I know in agreement outlier. with that. Yeah, no, 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 it's just fine. I, I, think, I think the water level rises. Ron, jump in. I, I, I think that there would be a starting point in business a little easier. And the starting point would be as simple as every year, everyone has an obligation to be 15% better. OK, so let's start there. So every year, that bar gets reset. The other thing comes back to this notion of your individual scorecard, which is if you achieve everything on your scorecard, absolutely everything, then you've met expectations, <laughs> period. <laughs> okay? Doing everything on your one. scorecard That's a big one. doesn't make you superior. That's right. It simply means you, you met your expectations. Right. That's right. And I think that's why it's so important to crystallize the goals at the beginning of the year at the individual level, not at the department level, uh, and, and also to have that regular conversation as part of the routine management process. But I think it is an issue. It's an issue we face in, in, in the for-profit sector, as you well know. But I think this notion of an, in, in, in calculating the expectation that everybody has to be materially better every year. Let me get Estelle into well, the conversation, then you shunt yeah. So I think one of the things that, that we've seen, and I think your ideas are excellent, and, and I think many of us have, have already found ways to incorporate them. But we also have some SESs who've been around a long time who really do believe they're outstanding across the board. But you find the agency isn't outstanding. And there has to be a relationship Absolutely. between the yes. performance even if they're meeting, it's possible to meet your performance goals and the agency not meet its performance goals. And I think in those situations, we need to make sure those are in sync. And that's one of the challenges we're having. We have this whole group of people who think they're outstanding, yet the agency is still struggling down here. And trying to get the two in sync, I think, is, is one of the, the tough things that a, a COO and, and, and COO have to struggle with. So it's not, they don't get a pass on it. And I like that concept of 15% each time. The only thing I was going to suggest to actually echo Liz and Ron's point was uh, as a framework, it might help to have the conversation with two dimensions, potential and performance. Yeah. And each one of them has potential, which is why they're at the SES. But they may not be performing every year at that level. Mm -hmm. And so I think that actually helps you you know, not make it appear like they don't have potential, but you know, performance changes Can I every year. One last Please. Thing about to Tony's point, because all of us have encountered this, I haven't been in an organization where I didn't have to get on stage in front of people and say, I stand before you as the president or CEO having received, to Ron's point, me fully meets ratings. And everyone's like, yes, I have received that fully meets ratings because that's a good rating. It means you're doing your job. I have found that I have needed to do that kind of dramatic gesture of saying, here I am. I bet you think I've always gotten superior ratings. I haven't. Because there is this expectation, good is that fully meets means you're doing a really good job. 
But that has to sometimes be done in a dramatic way by the leader. Have you ever set strength goals on top All of the time. meets and, and sit down and specifically define them? Because it's, you know, the old adage is you don't get extra points for doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And that's kind of the fully meets. But then we want people to stretch. We want them to go beyond. We want to set goals that they may not meet, I mean, but try to strive for. But do you I define those, the, or do you let them define them for themselves? But I think part of the leadership definition in, in business, it may be a little easier, because yeah, if good. you earn, make it simple, $100 this year in your unit, next year earning $100 is not success. Right. Right. So the, the goal has to go up, and each year it is, in fact, a more aggressive goal. And so I but think that's it a fully meets goal, you know, that you're saying, I want you to get $115 next year, but do you say, and you know what, it would really be great if you could get 130 And I mean, it, I'm not sure you'll yeah, get there. But. I think you have to look at what the organization needs. And then come back to Estelle's point of comment. If the organization isn't achieving, but the individual is, that individual's goal ought to be get the organization achieving. Right. right. Yeah, that's it's sort of take, take Jim's trigger. question head on. I assume that most of you said, "Here's what I need from you, but here's what would hit the ball out of the ballpark." You don't yes. leave that to people's imagination. You no. put that. No. In. No. no. So they. Yeah, I mean, there's a threshold of fully met. That that to Stell's point, if the agency doesn't make it, the individual can't make it. I mean, and that's almost like a collar, if you will, on the, on the rating. Right. And just to reinforce the point that Gail and Ron are making, the, the cultural change is people get to the point where they think meeting expectations means they should get more. Meeting expectations just meant you did your job this year. Mm -hmm. That's the baseline. Uh, then we define what it takes to achieve more on top of that. Right. But I think that just one other thing to Tony's point and Estelle's point, there's the dimension of performance, meeting expectations, but you have to talk about relative performance, which is another factor, which is either your performance, but how did your department do? Your performance, but how did the company do? Um, your performance, but how did we do against our relative competitive group, mm -hmm. peer group? So when we, in the example of Motorola, you know, we can meet our goals of revenue growth is X, gross margin is Y, operating earnings is Z, and cash is Q, and not have a good year. Because we talk about our competitors may have performed better. We might, our stock may have been up 12%, theirs was up 18. So there has to be a context for two things performance and relative performance, either with other people, the department, the division, the company, or a peer group. And when you introduce the relative performance part, it kind of expands the thinking of, you can't just do your 10 goals and say, I'm outstanding. Your 10 goals first to Jeff and Ron and Gail meets expectations, and anything above and beyond needs to relatively be calibrated against the broader Right, I got to play timekeeper here. So we have everyone's got the form. This is a first step, but clearly this is all about implementation um, going forward. So my uh, my suggestion would be that we touch base, probably not in our June meeting, but in our October meeting, John, uh, and get a sense of of where we are on implementation, what we've learned, what's working, what's not working, and then do another. You know, half hour, 45 minute discussion. This is a very rich discussion and mm -hmm. arguably is the most critical thing that we're doing um, is to help develop the SES through much more rigorous performance reviews. And I think there's some best practices in government, but for the most part, um, the time and energy doesn't go into these types of conversations the way it should. And, it, and those conversations and that rigor has, a, as we all know, a very high return. Let's do a um, five minute break and we're gonna switch from SES to IT. Um, I have that it's seven after, so why don't we have a, a, a firm start at quarter after. I'll give it seven or eight minutes. Good, thank you.